So, hi everyone. My name is Michael Lardner. I am from the Marxist Education Project. Before we uh, hear Jason's presentation that I'm very looking forward to, we have a few events coming up. And here with us today is uh, Fred Murphy, who is part of the MEP, who is going to be chairing tomorrow's talk, Soldiers of the Revolution. Uh, which is about the Paris Commune. Could you say a word or two on that, Fred? Uh, yeah, Mark Laws, who's an uh, American U.S. labor historian, uh, but has uh, kind of branched out in recent years to uh, uh, Europe, has been working on a book which has just been published uh, called uh, Soldiers of Revolution, which is about the... Uh, rise of militarism in the late 19th century, the uh, formation of mass armies, the participation of working people in the Franco-Prussian War, and the consequences uh, for uh, French politics, and, and especially in terms of the, the Paris Commune, which was uh, made up of many, uh, in part of many, you know, soldiers who were veterans of the war that had just concluded. And, in the Franco-Prussian War. So uh, he's going to present his research and, and work on that and relate the, uh, the Paris Commune to the uh, rise of militarism in, in Europe and, the, and the, the changes in military technology as well. And, and I will announce next week's events, which you may have seen if you've gone to our website. Jane Holgate is coming from the UK to speak on her new book, Arise. And will speak to many aspects on union organizing that actually are not, are showing that the future is not so bleak and is speaking of some victories that have been won lately that are from new initiatives and will be uh, addressing that in her new book from Pluto Press called Arise. The day after we have uh, a book on a new type of enclosure that's happening today. It's called Rubbish Belongs to the Poor, but it is about how capital, and I'm sure that capital knew, capitalists knew, but there is now enclosures taking place around large waste dumps where marginal, the marginalized people have been finding ways to re reproduce themselves but there is now what is called hygienic enclosure. And uh, there will be a report on that next Sunday. It is my great pleasure to introduce all of you. If you don't already know Jason, you may know his work, but Jason Reed has generously given up his Saturday afternoon to be with us to present on Spinoza and Marx. I already got a short preview while he tested his uh, PowerPoint out. And I would let, rather let Jason speak for himself than say too much. And I'm giving you the Zoom room floor right now, Jason. Take it away. Uh, thank you very much. And thanks, uh, everyone, for turning out today. Um, so what I'm, what I'm not going to do, I mean, there are lots of different ways you could approach this question of Spinoza and Marx. You could uh, approach the question of Spinoza's actual influence on Marx uh, uh, in terms of both Marx's own copying of passages from the Tractatus Theological Politicus into his notebooks and, and also the more indirect way in which uh, Marx picked up a lot of Spinoza through both Feuerbach and Hegel. Um, I'm not going to talk about that, nor am I going to really talk about the history of uh, the intersection of Marxism and Spinoza. What I want to talk about is, as the title sort of says, Connections and Provocations, I want to group some of the fundamental problems, uh, philosophical and political, around which this sort of conjunction of Spinoza and Marx happens. Um, and in doing so, I'm going to do an overview, because I don't mean to suggest um, there's anything necessarily unified or monolithic about something called like Spinozist Marxism. I think there are divergences and differences within the people who have uh, people such as uh, Louis Althusser, Antonio Negri, André Tossel, Etienne Balibar, uh, Pierre Macheret, Frederick Laudon, etc., who have turned to this connection between Spinoza and Marx. There are differences that are as interesting as the commonalities, but I did want to flesh out some of the uh, 
uh, sort of points of intersection. And in doing so, I guess the kind of backdrop behind this question or the kind of behind this presentation is to think about why the, and maybe talk about this, especially um, in the discussion after, because I, I plan for about, and an give or take, um, about an hour or so of a presentation, leaving us for what I hope will be an hour or so of uh, discussion and conversation. And, and one of the things that I'm sort of aiming towards um, is to talk about uh, uh, why, you know, afterwards we can talk about why uh, the Spinoza Marx connection has become Hi. so important. Um, and just the first three minutes. Uh, can everyone maybe mute? It might make sense for everyone to be muted while we're doing this. I hate to be. There we go. That's okay. So, um, Let's begin. And I do have a um, presentation for this. Let's see. Okay. So I have this broken down into five fundamental uh, uh, points of intersection. First one is ideology. And in some sense, uh, beginning with this, we might in some sense also beginning somewhat chronologically, at least within the late 20th century turn to, uh, uh, to Spinoza that starts at first, in some accounts with Althusser. Althusser plays an important role. And one of the points uh, that Althusser, of course, drew from is the way in which, especially the appendix of part one of Spinoza's ethics was in Althusser's terms, to be considered the matrix of every possible theory of ideology. Now the appendix to part one of the ethics is a very uh, rich and provocative text. Um, and one of the things that Spinoza does in that text is try to uh, not so much advanced necessarily a theory of ideology, but he's really trying to show why it is that people uh, begin with two very flawed assumptions as far as Spinoza's concerned. One, um, that they are in some sense uh, free, um, causes of their own desires and volitions, and two, that the universe is organized according to not only their causes and desires, but the causes and desires of some greater being, namely God. And one of the interesting things about Spinoza's uh, appendix to part one of the ethics is that he, he thinks he can sort of explain the basis of these two things from what he thinks is a fairly basic and fundamental starting point. As he says uh, in the appendix, quoting what I have here, it'll be sufficient here if I take as foundation what everyone must acknowledge, that all men are born ignorant of the causes of things, and they all want to seek their advantage and are conscious of this appetite. From these assumptions, it follows first that men think themselves free because they are conscious of their volitions and their appetite and do not even in their dreams, uh, and I think even in their dreams, the causes by which they're disposed to wanting and willing because they're ignorant of those causes. And then to give Althusser's version of this, um, uh, in what follows, the imagination is to put the human subject, the center and origin of every perception, of every action, of every object, and of every meaning, but two, to reverse in this way the real order of things, since the real order is explained solely by the determination of causes, which subjectivity of the imagination explains everything by means of ends, by the subjective illusion of the ends of its desire and it and its expectations. This is, strictly speaking, to reverse the order of the world, to put, to make it walk, as Hegel and Marx will say, on its head. It is put to work, as Spinoza superbly said, entire apparatus, an apparatus of reversal of causes into ends. So for people who are familiar with uh, Althusser's famous uh, ideolo ideology and ideological state apparatuses essay, here we see the basic points of that, which many people have commented is in some sense, or can be understood as a reading of Spinoza's appendix, the centrality of the subject for ideology. Um, uh, 
and the centrality of uh, 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 a, a fundamental misrecognition that the subject takes itself as the cause rather than the effect, uh, that when, when ideology interpolates us as subjects, we act as if the beliefs and ideas that we have stem from our own decisions rather than produced by our own historical place and, and social circumstance. Now, the other thing, and there is a tension here um, between, I think, Spinoza and, and Althusser, and it's an interesting tension in that, as, as Althusser says in the end of that passage, he understands you know, ideology to be, in some sense, an apparatus, a mechanism by which people see themselves as subjects and see themselves as causes and centers determining their own understanding of the world. Now, uh, the passage from Spinoza is much more, one could almost say, anthropological and less institutional. Right? We see ourselves as causes of our desires because we are born conscious of our desires. Right? We, we know that we have desires for you know, food, clothing, and shelter and other things, but we're ignorant of the causes of things, including the causes of our own desires. So there is a tension, and, and we can talk about this hopefully too, and I think uh, Althusser struggles with this, between the more or less kind of anthropological basis of Spinoza's idea of the imagination, although Althusser in some sense embraced sort of that, some of that, which is why Althusser quite famously claimed that, you know, ideology was kind of an uh, unavoidable fact of social existence, that to see oneself as a subject is something that cannot be, it can be it can be put aside briefly in moments of what he would call science or understanding the, the historical causes that shape one's perspective, but one would always lapse back in to that, that moment. Now, there is a second aspect of, uh, of Spinoza and ideology, drawing not so much from, from the appendix to the ethics, but from Spinoza's political writings, most notably the Tractatus Theological Politicus. And here, um, and here I'm, I've included my lovely yard sign, which the people at Crit Trip have made. Um, uh, here uh, we get the famous line from the, the TTP, as it's called, the supreme met mystery of despotism, its prop and stay, is to keep men in a state of deception and with a specious title of religion to cloak the fear with which they must be held in check so they will fight for their servitude as if for salvation and count it no shame but the highest honor to spend their blood and lives for the glorification of one man. And this is the, and then I have the passage from Deleuze and Guattari, Capitalism Schizophrenia, the fundamental problem of political philosophy is still precisely the one that Spinoza saw so clearly and that Wilhelm Reich rediscovered. Why do men fight for their servitude? servitude as stubbornly as if it was their salvation. So if we think of Spinoza as a theorist of ideology, here I think he adds something that's, that is seen by many as very important, that ideology is not just, as Marx argued, the dominant ideas, which are the ideas of the dominant class, but ideology has to be understood as something which, as Althusser would say, and Frederick Lordon would say too, and as well as those in Guattari, something that makes people go. That ideology makes people not just endure or put up with their rule, but become active participants in it, to desire their own subjection. So the question of ideology um, becomes, in some sense, I think, a, a, or enters into a second question, and that is this idea, which comes from both uh, Althusser and other readers of Spinoza as well, the idea of imminent causality. Now, um, Spinoza, and this is going to seem at, at first glance to be quite far from thinking about ideology, thinking about politics, thinking about Marx. Uh, Spinoza quite famously argues, uh, I put two propositions from the ethics about this point, that God is the imminent, not the transitive cause of all things, that for Spinoza, um, as Spinoza also famously said, God, that is nature. Spinoza is very critical of the notion of God as being sort of a transcendent uh, cause of the world and the universe, that the universe has to be understood as nothing other than the imminent expression of God's own uh, power. Um, so that in some sense, in imminent causality, the cause exists only in terms of its effect. Um, so everything has to be understood as a cause and an effect. Now, of course, Althusser drew from this 
um, that in reading Capital, that Spinoza offered a whole new way of thinking about causality. That, uh, in that text, Althusser isolates there's sort of what he would call efficient causality or the typical kind of linear causality of a billiard ball hitting another billiard ball or what he would also call expressive causality. And that's the causality that Althusser associates with Hegel in the sense that, you know, often in Hegel, you, you get these versions where, you know, the entire moment of spirit is reflected in one particular instance, right? The entire Greek world can be found in the conflict between Antigone and Creon around individuality and tradition, that the, 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 the social totality is expressed uh, in one central contradiction. So in place of this, uh, Althusser argues, this implies therefore that the effects are not outside the structure not a pre-existing object, element, or space in which the structure arrives to imprint its mark. On the contrary, it implies the structure is imminent in its effects, a cause imminent in its effects in the Spinoza sense of the term, that the whole existence of the structure consists of its effects. In short, that the structure, which is a specific combination of its peculiar elements, is nothing outside of its effects. So I think to think about what this means in terms of uh, thinking about capitalism, um, here we get this passage from Ballybor, which I think is very important. Instead of adding a theory of superstructure to the existing theory of the structure, he had to transform the concept of structure itself by showing that its process of production and reproduction originally depends on unconscious ideological conditions. As a consequence, a social formation is no longer represented in dualistic terms, a thesis that logically should lead us to abandon the image of superstructure. Another concept of historical complexity must be elaborated with opposite sociological, anthropological, an ontological prerequisite. So um, what it, here's the connection I think that's very important between the idea of ideology, right? Because what does ideology do according to Althusser? Ideology makes possible the reproduction of the relations of production, right? Without ideology, the workers don't come back to work the next day. Um, and so in some sense, ideology becomes a way of understanding the imminent cause, because um, rather than see, as some would argue, right, based on the classic image of the base and superstructure, that ideology is simply an effect, epiphenomenal, that what is really happening is happening in the base. Althusser's argument is that the base, in some sense, depends upon what happens in the superstructure, right, that without ideology, capitalism doesn't function. So what is seen here as an effect the effect being the ideological interpolation of the workers who, because they see themselves as subjects, are unwilling or unable to see the way in which their own desires, including their desires to show up for work, their desires to consume commodities, are produced because they don't see their desires as produced. They think themselves as free. They show up to work each day. And that effect of capitalist society is, in turn, its cause. Now, this idea of imminence, I think, also becomes a way to understand, and I want to, from here, talk about some uh, different variations within Spinoza's Marxism, because it makes possible a way to understand some of the uh, conflicts uh, within Spinoza's Marxism. Because I think one of the other um, uh, understandings of imminence comes from another interpreter of uh, Spinoza and another reader of Spinoza from the Marxist tradition, but in a very different way, and that's Antonio Negri. For Antonio Negri, um, I think the imminent cause means that, um, in some sense, this is you know Negri's version, right? The the so-called autonomous thesis uh, was the idea espoused by by Mario Tronti that working class struggle precedes and prefigures capitalist restructuring that imminence has to be understood as not just the imminent cause of the capitalist structure in its effects, but the imminence of labor, of workers to everything that takes place. So there are two passages here from, from Negri. One, um, in other words, in the post-industrial age, the Spinozian critique of representation of capitalist power corresponds more to the truth than does the analysis of political economy. What does Negri mean by the 
the Spinozian critique of the representation of capitalist power. He means the way in which one of Spinoza's fundamental critical perspectives uh, is to show that uh, what is taken as in some sense a uh, cause, the power of God, or in some sense, you want to read Spinoza in the Machiavellian tradition that's also important, the power of the king has to be itself understood as an effect, it has to be understood as the king only has, and this is something that Spinoza says in, in the Tractatus of theological political treatise, there never has been a king who has not been a, more afraid of their subjects. That the true power always comes from the people, from the multitude, or as, as Negri puts it, the, the Spinoza, the forces of production produce the relations of production. Um, so there is, I think, a, an important tension between the Althusserian reading of, of the conjunction of Spinoza and Marx, in which the imminent cause is capital itself existing in its effects, but to some extent, these still are the effects of capital, even though these effects are in turn causes that ideology is both an effect of the capitalist structure and its necessary cause of its condition, there still is a sense in which these are effects of capital, although that's an odd thing to say because I think the entire notion of of imminent cause is supposed to break down any kind of hierarchy um, and then for, for, for Negri, as, he, as this one line says, with Spinoza, the forces of production produce the relations of production. The imminence here is the imminence of labor. The, for Negri, and the most basic fundamental point is that we have to remember at all points and at all times, everything that is presented to us as stemming from capital is actually stemming from the organization of the of labor of the multitude. So this brings us to the third problem and that is FX. So uh, here, um, just a brief uh, overview of some of uh, Spinoza's fundamental notions around FX. Uh, first from the uh, preface to part three, the FX therefore of hate, anger and envy and the like considered in themselves follow the same necessity uh, same order of nature, other singular things. Therefore, I shall treat the, the power of the effects and the power of the mind of them by the same method by which in the preceding parts I treated God and the mind, and shall consider human appetites. This is a, this is a question of lines, planes, and bodies, right? Spinoza's fundamental assertion that rather than see the affects as something or the emotional life as something in some sense outside um, of rationality outside of order, they have to be understood to have their own causality, their own order, and their own logic to them. Um, and then uh, two other quotes from Spinoza asserting both the importance of affective determination for the individual and for the collectivity. Uh, uh, Spinoza writes, desire is man's very essence insofar as it conceived to be determined when a given affection to do something so that uh, and we'll get more into this in a little little bit, uh, desire, every, just like everything in the universe strives to persevere in its being, everything has a fundamental canatus, and human beings, that, does, that striving takes the form of both appetite and desire, desire being un- understood as appetite plus an understanding of it, but this striving is in some sense, uh, and this is what makes it modal, exists to be shaped inclined and modified, right? Desire is always um, a desire to do something determined by some possible affect. Um, So that what we desire is shaped by how we've been affected. And uh, to understand desire is to understand the conjunction of the way in which we are both effects of things around us and in some sense causes. Another consequence of imminent causality is of course everything has to be understood as uh, both a cause and an effect. Uh, And then lastly uh, from from the political treatise, since men as we have said 
are led more by passion than by reason, it naturally follows that people will unite and consent to be guided as if by one mind, not at reason's prompting, but through some common emotion, such as common hope or common fear, or desire to avenge some common injury. So I, I put those two passages together to point out that, that as much as affective composition individuates one, that my loves and hates are not the same as your loves and hates, and they're different because you and I have different histories. We've been affected in different ways by different things. There's a certain way in which affective composition is shaped by, by everyone's idiosyncratic uh, history and encounters. Um, there is also a sense in which affective composition, in fact, Spinoza is pretty adamant that, um, that collective bodies and collective life must be understood primarily through a common emotion and that there is commonality, despite the idiosyncratic experience, there are common affects, common desires that shape and determine our collective life. So, um, and the question becomes, of course, how to understand the intersection of the two. And so here I turn briefly to a, uh, another Spinoza's Marxist. And, you know, it's, it's here, I mean, I sort of say this, it's interesting, and this is something I've, I guess I'm trying to underscore a little bit. There are Spinoza's Marxists who take Spinoza's theory of the imagination to ground a theory of ideology, in the case of Althusser. There's Spinoza's Marxists that take Spinoza's theory of imminent causality to ground a sort of understanding of imminence, an understanding of a, a causality that flattens the hierarchy between base and superstructure, which includes, I think, Althusser, but also Deleuze and Guattari. Um, and then there are, I think, Spinoza's Marxists who focus primarily on the affects. And Frederick Lordon definitely takes affective life to be central to his understanding of Spinoza. Um, so, um, as Lordon says, collective human life reproduces itself or begins to change solely as a consequence of the interplay of people's interaffections, or to say this in the simplest way as possible, out of the effect they have on one another, but always through the mediations of institutions and social relations. Um, and here, I think, going back to the tension I pointed to earlier of two different ways of understanding imminent causality, that uh, for Althusser, it's the imminence of the structure in its effects, while for Negri, it is the imminence of the multitude and of labor to the institution, to some extent, um, I think Lordon and also uh, one of his collaborators, Yves Citon, has tried to kind of resolve that tension through this notion of what they call imminent transcendence. And basically their argument is um, that we have to understand the way in which um, what appears to us to be something that is dictated um, from above, something that has the weight of authority, like in the sense of some common object of love or hate um, that seems to be the basis of political belonging, right? The way in which, say, so sort of forms of nationalism and forms of other types of political belonging coalesce around commonly revived and reviled objects of love and hate, that what appears to us to come from a, the top has to be understood as nothing other than the organization of what is below. Uh, and as he says, uh, this is from the recently translated Imperium, the top proceeds from the bottom in the final analysis. That is the apparent paradox of imminent transcendence because the defending, descending phase has been preceded and gendered by the ascending phase. Thus, what in fact comes from the bottom is perceived and imagined as having all the attributes of coming from the top, vertical authority, affective community, and incommensurable power. And yet the power is in fact out of the multitude itself, but as if separated from it. So, I mean, what Lordon is getting at in the paradox here, and, and to some extent, and I didn't go in this direction, there's a certain sense in which there's an attempt to revive a kind of Spinoza's version of a theory of alienation that alienation is to some extent the way in which we fundamentally misrecognize the role our common 
affects play in the structuring of our own affective life in the sense that what a, what what um what appears to be something which determines and drives our common affective life has to be understood as nothing other than the uh, organization of our affective life. Um, and as uh, Lord Don goes on to argue, um, this is most clearly seen, I think, one of the things that Lord Don has done, I think, is that is interesting is to try and think about about capitalism and the labor relation itself in terms of an organizing of affective life. And so um, here, starting with a passage from Spinoza, um, so the infinite believes that he freely wants the milk, the angry child, that he wants vengeance, and the timid flight. Again, the drunk believes from a free decision of the mind that he says those things which afterwards, when sober, he wishes he had not said. So the madman, the chatterbox, the child, and a great many kind of many people of this kind believe they speak from a free decision of the mind when really they cannot contain their impulse to speak. Because this prejudice is innate in all men, they are not easily freed from it. And here, these are two passages from me. Um, so Lord Dawn offers a history of the striving uh, under three different regimes of capitalist exploitation, corresponding to the emergence of capitalism, the consumer society, and contemporary neoliberals. This history is mapped onto two axes. The first drawn from Marx is considered in terms of division between production and consumption, the two spheres of activity. The second axis drawn from Spinoza is that of joy and sadness understood as an increase or decrease in one's power and capacity. From these two coordinates, it's possible to chart the history of capital. The first phase of this history corresponds to the initial formation of capitalism, what Marx called formal subsumption. The primary institutional basis for capitalism at this stage is the absence of any alternative to wage labor, the destruction of any commons or sustenance economy, fear is a motive, a driving force orienting the striving, the cannotis, but a limited one. People compelled by fear will work, but only as much as necessary to stave off punishment. Those who do not work do not eat, and it is fear of starvation or homelessness that keeps people working. Fear is not only a limited incentive, it is also a fundamentally unstable one. Fear can drive one to revolt as much as, as it can drive one to work. From, from this then, Lord Maps the sec second stage that roughly corresponds with Fordism. For Ford Lord Dahm, the institutional effect of Fordism is one of the destruction and pleasures and pride of concrete labor, the pleasures of particular skill in favor of a general shift of desire away from labor towards consumption. For its $5 day establishes an effective economy, exchanging sadness and frustration at work for the pleasure of the newly emergent consumer society. The final, or at least the most recent change in this effective economy reorients pleasure towards work, but is no longer the pleasure of a particular skill, job, or the result of work. It is the pleasure of employment itself. It is a desire that as much as possible modeled on abstract labor, as much as there are still pleasures to concrete labor, and Le Don follows Spinoza in arguing that individuals will always affirm their power of existing. In other words, they will find whatever pleasures are to be had in the workday, from those associated with the task at hand to the gossip and water cooler task talk that accompany every work experience. The modern ideal is as much as possible an indifference to a specific job in the name of flexibility and dedication to work itself. I mean, this is, of course, the modern version of, you know, the sort of Silicon Valley ideology of, you know, find a job you love and you'll never have to work a day in your life, uh, which really in Spinoza's formulation, um, we could say that just as the infant thinks that he or she wants milk, the employee freely believes that he or she wants to work. Um, in each case, we have to understand that what appears, I mean, this goes back to, I mean, so there is a connection, of course, between the reading Spinoza for a theory of ideology, which focuses on the, the idea of ideology of the subject of the free subject and the focus on the affects. But I think one of the important things for this, for Lodon's reading of the Spinoza Marx conjunction is to really insist that the channeling or structuring of the affects is in some sense or in some sense, it cannot be called ideology because it is not, it is not about an ideology, at least in the terms of the dominant ideals of the dominant class, but the way in which we are all sort of uh, trained to both um, desire work and to um, 
to think of consumption as the reward of our work is something that is in some sense, you know, almost pre or sub ideological, that there is an affective formation of the subject that is prior to a constitutive of any ideological formation. The way in which, I mean, you know, you can, you can think of this biographically and the way in which, you know, as, you know, as kids, at least uh, maybe in the U.S. or in some places, we are all kind of given an initial training of wage labor when our parents first tell us that in order to, you know, get money to buy the things we want, we're going to have to do chores around the house, that that is as much a a sort of shaping of our affective composition as it is, you know, some basic parental lesson. And that to some extent, the connection we make between um, uh, work as a way of understanding our striving, or to strive is to work, and to work is to strive, and consumption is understanding our pleasure, is in some sense prior to and uh, uh, and uh, prior to and the precondition of any kind of ideological interpolation. So capital first structures our desire and it structures our desire not through some ideas about how things ought to be by simply the training by which we come to see work as a way of getting what we want and commodification as what we want. So uh, the fourth The fourth sort of problem, and this has kind of been imminent, I mean, these problems are all in some sense folding onto one another, is trans individuality. Um, because already when talking about desire as being both the striving of every individual, um, a desire which is profoundly shaped by our relations with others, we are already beginning to see uh, a way of thinking. What, what does trans individuality mean? It means a way of thinking. Uh, beyond the dualism or binary of the individual versus society and thinking the mutual constitution of individuation in and through collectivity. And here I decided to, since we're talking, suppose about Spinoza and Marx, I wanted to um, point out that, that this idea is in some sense, uh, I'm going to talk a minute about how it's found in Spinoza, but it is also uh, found in uh, Marx, uh, most famously, as many people have commented in the, in the sixth thesis on Feuerbach, um, uh, where Marx writes, uh, Feuerbach resolves the religious essence with the human essence, but the human essence is no abstraction inherent in each single individual. In its reality, it is the ensemble of social relations. Uh, and it's really in Feuerbach who does not enter upon a criticism of this real essence is constantly compelled to abstract the historical process and fix the religious sentiment as something by itself and presuppose an abstract, isolated human individual. Essence, therefore, can be only comparated as genus, as internal dumb generality, which naturally unites the many individuals. I mean, the key and the sort of cryptic and confusing fade phrase that many people have struggled with is this idea of the human essence being in its reality or in its actuality, the ensemble of social relations. Uh, and actually Marx uses the French ensemble in this passage. Um, and this notion that, that to think the individual as nothing other than um, its, its social relations. Um, and this uh, idea, of course, um, has a, an important critical perspective in, in Marx as well, in this famous passage in the Grandris, where he says, uh, uh, only in the 18th century in civil society, the various forms of social connectedness confront the individual as a mere means toward his private purpose as external necessity. But the epoch which produces the standpoint, that of the isolated individual, is also precisely that of the hitherto most developed Social from the standpoint general relations, the human being is the most little sense a political animal, not merely a gregarious animal, but an animal which can individuate itself only in the midst of society. So here in terms of there's a, a I think a really strong, and I've written a whole book about this, Politics of Trans Individuality, a really strong point of connection between Spinoza and Marx um, in the sense that both of them understand that there is, although they give different reasons, there is a tendency for us to see ourselves, as Spinoza would say, as a kingdom within a kingdom, 
to see ourselves as the cause of our desires, not recognize the constitutive relations that shape and determine us. And although, as we, as we discussed, Spinoza sees this as primarily being almost a, a, an anthropological illusion hardwired in our way of making sense of the world. Marx sees this as more, I think, a historical product that is only in the 18th century in civil society that we get, you know, the, the individual can see itself as separate and independent in a society in which it is able to, to engage with market relations. And the isolated individual is not itself a kind of almost anthropological illusion taken from how we misrecognize ourselves and our relationship to the world, but is more or less a, a, a product of particular historical circumstances. So Spinoza and Marx both have a same, although different, criticism. But more importantly, as I've tried to say, uh, Spinoza and, and Marx have a similar positive notion as well. If the isolated individual is itself a, an illusion, an inadequate idea, or maybe even an ideological idea, then we have to understand to replace it with this idea of what uh, so what, what Paulo Virna would say, reading the Grundrisse as well, the social individual, or what Etienne Balibar has drawn his folks to their common commitment to sort of trans individuality. And these are two quotes from Etienne Balibar's uh, uh, Spinoza, the trans individual book. Um, uh, first, reflecting on uh, Spinoza's uh, definition, the desire is the very essence of man. Uh, Balibar writes, the metaphysical notion of essence has undergone a profound change Instead of referring to a class or a genius, it now refers to the singularity of individuals. Right? Because if, to say desire is the essence of human beings means that every different human being has a different desire, thus a different essence. And, and there is in Spinoza, I think, a profound way of connecting that seemingly uh, almost nominalism of individuals with an insistence of relations. For Spinoza, every individual in nature is reality a trans individual, which is to say a finite relation, relational mode. This leads to paradoxical ontology in which individuals conserve themselves by virtually decomposing and recomposing themselves, constantly exchanging with other individuals, parts or affections they share with them as a function of a larger and more complex totality into which they must integrate to survive. So uh, for both Spinoza and Marx, we have to understand our existence as a uh, trans individual as simultaneously individuated uh, and simultaneously a production of and reproducing various forms of collectivity as well. Um, and one of the things that I think uh, uh, Balibar insists upon is the fact that and here we get, um, uh, well, maybe not an important point of difference, but at least an important sort of transformation of the Spinoza-Marx conjunction. One of the things that Balibar has, has insisted on repeatedly is the, no, the sense in which um, to think trans individuality in Spinoza means we have to understand that we are, we are trans individual both in terms of our affective life, we are shaped by shared passions, desires that we have just being part of the same historical moment, and we are trans individual in terms of our uh, our thinking life as well to to know and to understand the world. I mean, this is why Spinoza says the proposition of thought is not as Descartes says I think, but uh, excuse the gender terminology here. Man thinks that to think is always to think collectively and shared to have common notions. And one of the interesting things um, uh, is that. Uh, that Balibar insists upon is the relationship between our trans individual affective life and our trans individual intellectual life um, begins to become a way of understanding political and ideological and affective conflict. Uh, one of the things that, that Balibar really draws on in his reading of Spinoza is uh, Proposition 37 of Part 4 of the Ethics. Um, which is the place in the ethics where Spinoza talks about the constitution of political life. And one of the things that interests uh, Balibar about that is that in that passage, uh, Spinoza gives two different accounts as to why it is 
that human beings come together to live in some kind of common life. And the one, the one de demonstration is based on reason um, uh, that uh, insofar as men live according to the guidance of reason, they're most useful to man. Uh, hence, we just say strive to bring about that men live according to the guidance of reason. Apologies for the typo there. That uh, rationality tells us that we are finite beings. And as finite beings, we uh, need the cooperation and coexistence of other people in order to live the best possible lives. Nothing is more useful to man than man. Once again, apologies for the gender terminology, it's Spinoza's language. Um, but because of that, um, uh, we realize that it makes sense for us to come together, to combine our powers, uh, and so on. But what's interesting for for Balibar, and I, I included on the side of this, the, the, his breakdown of this um, from Spinoza and politics, uh, that there's a second demonstration. And Spinoza rarely gives two demonstrations for the same thing, but it's, it's an interesting point. Um, uh, that second demonstration is according not to reason, but the affects. The good which man wants for himself and, and loves, he will love more constantly if he sees that others love it. Once again, another typo. So strive others to love the same thing. Um, and as Balibar says, concluding about this, sociability is therefore the unity of real agreement and ambiv imaginary ambivalence, both of which have real effects. Because one of the things that Balibar draws attention to, and it's one of the things that talks about a lot, is that the commonality that we shape by the affects can never really be a true commonality. I mean, Spinoza is very insistent that as far as we're determined by the affects, we are in conflict with each other. Now, what does it mean to say the commonality by the affects can never really be a true commonality? Well, I mean, Spinoza would say, point out that there is a fundamental ambivalence when we want other people to love what we want. And we want that. Spinoza thinks that it's, it, it's very difficult to love what another man leaves alone, to use his terminology. It's very difficult to be singular and unique in one's effort. We want other people to desire what we desire. But that is a fundamentally ambivalent proposition. Because if in the case, and this Spinoza thinks is the case for most things, except for desiring other people to be led by reason, most of the objects of our desire um, uh, are finite, so people can't love the same thing. Or I think there's an interesting, and this is why I think Balibar, who's written a lot about nationalism and citizenship and so on, uh, I think Balibar would say that a certain way in which conflicts over national identity are often conflicts about the common affective constitution of the social in the sense that in some sense, you know, what is what is the accusation uh, that fuels anti-immigrant and other forms of, of, of hostility? I think in some levels, Balibar would say it is, and this is a very Spinoza's thing to say, it is the accusation these people don't love the same thing in the right way, right? They are not loving the same common object in the same way. And this, this brings us to, I think, a really interesting uh, point talked a lot about points of commonality, point of tension between uh, uh, Spinoza and Marx that I think Balibar has drawn attention to. Um, this is Balibar writes, and this is in Violence and Civility. It'd be easy to conclude that Marx is basically unaware of the other scene of politics, the scene of communitarian affiliation, and therefore unaware of symbolic violence as well. Though he names it or has bequeathed us with the word ideology, one of the aptest of names for it. So Marx is unaware of the way in which, um, given, right, given that, as, as we said in the previous passage, that for, for Balibar, every social existence has to be understood as the, the, both a real agreement I mean, even in a capitalist society as which we're living in, which is you know, supposedly predicated on constituting as much competition and, and isolation and indifference towards each other as we've seen, I mean, you know, as we've all seen, especially during the pandemic, there is still, in some sense, a, a real agreement or there is still cooperation integral to a capitalist society. Um, so every society is both a real agreement and an imaginary identification. So to some extent, you know, for Balibar, Marx doesn't really understand uh, 
the conflicts over imaginary identification, conflicts over, and you can you know understand this as a reading maybe of the whole kind of failed problem of the, the national question in Marx that that you know Marxism has constantly failed to understand the way in which people are motivated by affective identifications around uh, identities um, that don't seem to be in their in their best interest, and then uh, to fill out the rest of this passage and to conclude that for Spinoza, for his part, basically ignores the irreducible level of economic antagonism, doubtless because of the economic level. The Canadas can perhaps be conceived as a productive force. Spinoza is basically an optimist and a utilitarian, right? This is, you know, Spinoza's, when Spinoza says man is, more, uh, nothing is more useful to man than man, he's not giving us a theory of exploitation. He is in some sense giving us a theory of commonality being the basis of our um, of our shared economic life. So, um, you know, one of the arguments would be, and we'll get into this uh, uh, hopefully in discussion, that why uh, why the turn to to Spinoza by Marxists, especially in the latter part of the 20th century. And I think there are two two answers that I've kind of been sketching out so far. One is that um, the 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 ideological dimension seems increasingly important and the affect and with that the idea that ideology has to be understood not just as a sort of uh intellectual problem as a as a as a wrong idea as a you know the idea of the ruling class but ideology has to be understood as have an irreducible affective component as well uh shaping affective attachments and so on um uh but i think another another part of the turn to Spinoza is the sense in which Spinoza makes possible an understanding of um, the way in which all conflicts are simultaneously, uh, political conflicts are simultaneously in some sense predicated on on this mixture of rationality and affect. Uh, That brings us to the last problem I want to talk about, and that is the problem of uh, practice, both understood as political practice, but also philosophical and theoretical practice. Um, And so uh, the first passage here, and this is a passage, kind of a a, a translation modified through uh, the reading of Pierre Macheret. um, And this is gets into some of the trickiest problems around uh, Spinoza's determinism, uh, or Spinoza writes, that thing is called free, which exists from the necessity of its nature alone, and is determined to act by itself alone. But a thing is called necessary or rather compelled, which is determined by another to exist and operate in a certain and determinate manner. Uh, The the, the shift of translation that Mascheret brings up is the the use of the word operate in there, English, I mean, it's English word, but that's the closer translation in the sense that to some extent for Spinoza, um, the only thing that is really free um, uh, although it's strange freedom, um, the only thing that exists by the nature, by its own nature alone, would be that of nature itself, or God that is nature. Everything else um, uh, to to act is to always operate in determined manner and determined conditions, um, and that, in some sense, I mean, this is not a, a profound point, but that, in some sense, I think is a very similar notion to the notion which is uh, integral to Marx, and that is uh, from the 18th Brumaire, men make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under, under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances existing already given and transmitted from the past. Uh, and then, so, um, the last passage is this notion from Pierre Machere that we have to understand that uh, all acting um, is in some sense operating. We always act in and within determinate conditions. Uh, theoretical practice too. I mean, this is the the, the notion that got you know Althusser in so much trouble that, that one does not theorize. This is one does not live and exist as a subject that is the cause and condition of one's own uh, uh, desires. Whenever one thinks, one always has to recognize that one thinks with determinate uh, in, from a determinate place with determinate concepts and to work through those determinate concepts. Uh, But there is ultimately, it seems to me, um, 
the sense in which um, what Spinoza offers um, is a way of thinking both the finite and limited uh, nature of one's own condition and one's own intervention, but that does not change the fact that um, uh, given the sort of idea of the imminent causality, given the sense that we are always both uh, effects and causes, including effects and causes of the very social system we live in that dominates us, there is a sense in which even though we are both we are finite, determined and shaped by, by that condition, we still as have the capacity to act in those conditions. And this is from Andre Tossel. Uh, Spinoza unites somehow two traits that are incompatible in all their philosophies. He corrects one conception by the other through confrontation that exceeds them both. On the one hand, he distanced himself from a conception of finitude, forboding men of any fantasy of mastery, referring to his moral condition as passionate servitude, a conception that is generally a property of religions which found their authority and domination on this weakness. On the other hand, he redefines an active and productive conception of this finitude. It has become a means for him to affirm and increase his power to think and act properly, a conception peculiar to the modern humanist tradition, sustained above all by the Enlightenment and by philosophical idealism. But Spinoza rejects the Promethean pretensions that make man a kingdom within a kingdom. This is a strange philosophy that unifies the infinite and the finite and finds no reason to despair or hope in the true idea that nature is indifferent to the ends that man proposes, but that does not prevent man, like any other mode, from striving to realize his causal power. Um, uh, elsewhere, Spinoza talks about, uh, sorry, elsewhere, Tossel talks about the, uh, the sense of what he calls a double determination, that all, um, this is a, a very different way of thinking, going along the lines of Mascheret's idea that all, all acting is operation, all acting is acting under and within determinate conditions, that uh, rather than the sort of classical schema which tries to juxtapose praxis and poesis, activity and production, we have to think of the way in which um, all action, all political action is shaped by production, by its material conditions, and all material conditions are themselves shaped and reworked by action. And including here, and I, and I didn't say enough about this, um, uh, you know, I think another reason why we might talk about Spinoza is the sense in which uh, what uh, Tossel calls a finite Marxism. And by finite Marxism, he means uh, he's distanced himself from the idea, the idea of a kind of sort of accelerationist Marxism that one could ever really truly be Promethean, sort of have done with relations of um, of domination and truly live in a kind of uh, liberated free society. Uh, that one always has to think of uh, a constitutive finitude um, that includes, and this is something that I, I didn't talk enough about and could maybe talk more about afterwards, it's the sense in which, um, just like I think a lot of people, uh, Marxists are turning and trying to think more about our, our relationship to the natural world, that part of our finitude is not just the way we are dependent upon our social existence and shaped by our social existence, but ultimately we are dependent upon uh, the non-human world, the natural world for our existence as well. Um, so. I'm gonna, gonna stop the sharing there. Um, so just to kind of um, uh, wrap it up, uh, talk about a, the, 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 the five sort of problems that I try to identify that traverse different types of uh, Spinoza's Marxism are the question of ideology, imminent causality, affects, trans individuality, and uh, last, uh, a reconsideration of both theoretical and political practice. Um, and I guess in some sense, all of them kind of come together with this sense of, um, I think, renewing what it means to, to think of ourselves as, um, as products of our world, uh, as both uh, uh, produced 
by and productive of the social relations we exist in and to recognize that that uh, means, you know, grasping ourselves as, as producing products is also means taking seriously th the affective as well as the shared intellectual life that shapes and determines our uh, political conflict. All right, that's... Um, That's my brief whirlwind tour of some fundamental problems within Spinoza's Marxism. So I'm, I'm sorry if I, you know, I, you, any, anything I can go over again, or you know, I don't know if I was pedantic or if I was what I don't know what the opposite of pedantic is. If I was going over uh, uh, or, or going too fast. It was fine, Jason. I have a question. Would you like? There's a lot to go over and. Do you want to take one question at a time or a few at a time? Only because there could be some fairly complex questions and we would lose sight of us some if we take too many. What, what do you, we already uh, have four people stacking, so. Um, I like, I like taking a few at a time. I just, okay. I think it makes sure we can get to, we, we can get to as, as many people as possible. I'm going to take all four of the people. There are four okay. right now. There is Alia, then Liz, then Ryan, then Matthew. So Alia, you go first. Thanks, Michael. Jason, thank you so much for this. This was, I, like, I, I know this is going to be a, a silly academic thing to say, but I couldn't imagine spending a Saturday afternoon doing something more fun. Um, and I have two questions, one of which is a, uh, a technical question that I can follow up on some of these thoughts, um, which is when you were talking about imminent causality, there was a slide in which you had um, quotations from Negri on the imminence mm -hmm. of labor. I would love to know what text and, and, and page numbers that are from. Um, which is the technical question. Um, but the other question, which is more a question of, it's still about immunocausality causality and ideology. Um, and it's something that I struggle with in my own writing and I'm, I'm hoping for some kind of provocation on how to move forward, which is how are we to understand the relationship between uh, capital and substance, substance in the Spinoza sense, which is um, in making interventions and comparisons like these, which I find very generative and I, and I do in my own work. Um, I often find myself having to defend against the charge of making capital into a substance of substantializing mm -hmm. capital, because I think, and when you uh, brought up the distinction between the tension between Althusser and Spinoza in terms of the understanding of ideology, Spinoza understanding it more anthropologically, maybe more as a, a a, a thing that happens in life, um, whereas Althusser talks about uh, ideology more institutionally, um, that's when I kind of found this, this tension, which is to say, are we just taking, you know, when we, when we work through analyses of capital and use uh, Spinoza's uh, theorizations of substance to make comparisons, is that merely an analogy? And if we are merely using um, Spinoza's, you know, the metaphysics from the ethics as an analogy, um, what does that, where does the status of Spinoza's thought remain? Because I don't think that Spinoza is just theorizing about capital. He's, theorized, he's attempting to make a theory of the world as it is, of being. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I don't quite know how to articulate the relationship. So any insights would be helpful. Thanks. Hey, Liz, you're up. Um, actually, uh, Isla just, just covered my question, so I'm good. Okay. Uh, Ryan? Uh, yeah, so I'm not really sure how to word this because I'm not really confident in my knowledge on this. But um, from my understanding, the distinction between like the Marxist theory of praxis and the anarchist theory of praxis is Marxists uh, believe in seizing state power. So insofar as Spinoza uh, would say that like our social relations shape us and like actually shape how we act and um, sort of shape how we can get out of these systems, why would the uh, a Spinozian defend engagement in a state if these social relationships can shape um, how we act. And Matthew. Uh, first of all, thank you, Jason. Um, my name is Matthew. I'm from um, Montreal. I just turned 18. And um, my question was, um, well, you're talking about problem three. You said that one of the components of uh, Fortis uh, ideological domination was um, uh, the idea that workers find pleasure in consumption after that they have, um, uh, well, that they've been.
alienated in the workplace. So I was wondering how does this relate to um, Herbert Marcuse's idea that um, um, that humans actually accomplish themselves through work, um, but the fact that we're alienated in the workplace means that uh, we have to find pleasure in our um, primitive desires uh, that we can find while consuming instead of uh, of working since, um, yeah, work doesn't belong to us. So Jason, that's round one. Uh, we'll get to a new yeah. question after this. All right, that's good, thank you. Um, so uh, uh, Aaliyah, and, uh, well, for the first easy part, uh, those are both quotes from Spinoza and us, from Negri. Um, second, uh, the more uh, the part that Aaliyah and Liz both sort of had in common. The um, yeah, I mean, I I think that there is you know the sense in which when you shift from God is the imminent cause to say capital is the imminent cause, there is reason to be concerned there, um, in the sense that. Uh, um, as as you said, you know, part of the it's there is a shift. I mean, one of the big points I think that you, you raised is that is that Spinoza was offering a theory of you know everything, you know, nature being the imminent cause, and there's both you know two problems. One is um, when we talk about capital, then there were, is there something that's not capital? When we talk about capital as being the imminent imminent cause, um, does capital are we are we risking substantializing? capital and making it something um you know this is like to think of the the criticism offered by uh a book that came out some time ago but jk gibson graham you know their book with the end of capital as we know it the, the tendency to monolithize and, and make capital seem more substantial than it than it is now i do think that that uh, in some ways some of the reading around Spinoza offers a way out of that. I mean, I think that some have insisted, I mean, Vittorio Morfino has written along these lines, that, um, that maybe we are first, maybe we are overly substantializing Spinoza's ontology. I mean, he's quite, he makes the argument that, that to some extent, a cause which exists only in its effects has to ultimately be understood as, and this is, you know, sounds very counterintuitive, especially given the way Spinoza is often read, that Spinoza is giving us a theory of what is real is relation, that substance exists only in terms of its effects, means that what exists are, in some sense, relations. Um, and it seems to me, um, and that seems very provocative to me, um, and that maybe the the problem is not so much in uh, uh, um, in our it's not it's not so much the problem is really not a problem of taking the substance and making it the capital. Maybe the problem is that we should understand um, a substance itself as substantial and and not and rather than itself as being relational. Um, Okay, so uh, second, uh, Ryan, question about uh, anarchist versus Marxist practice. The question of the state. Um, yeah, there's a lot to think about there. I, I think that one of the things, and since that was a point that I was, uh, 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 one of the th questions that comes up, I think, for especially for someone like Frederick Lodon, and he's written, two books really kind of arguing this point that um, the Spinoza's assertion that collective life is in some sense an organization of our affective life means that to some extent we cannot uh, get rid of some dimension of transcendence in that imminent transcendence. That collective life is always going to be both a product of our actually interacting desires and so forth, and a product which sort of distorts itself and seems to stand above um, our desires. Now, Lordon doesn't think that, ne that necessarily means 
a bad thing because in some sense, I mean, I, I think, you know, LeBron would say we would want to have a shared, I mean, because ultimately for Spinoza, um, the state is nothing other than a shared sense of what is right and wrong, that we would want to have a shared sense of what is right and wrong. We would just want that shared sense of right and wrong to be more subject to and more open to the actual uh, 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 desires and uh, striving of the individuals living underneath it, rather than being a sort of uh, simulacrum or uh, uh, particular class position imposed upon us. So I, I think that um, the one way of thinking about that, that I, I don't, I mean, I think that um, it's, I think on the one hand, I think that Spinoza is strangely ontologically anarchist in the sense of like, there is nothing organizing the, um, when he says desires man's very essence, there's nothing organizing, there's no, there's no, nothing we d strive towards, there's nothing shaping, we're only shaped by the totality of our encounters. There is nothing hardwired or, or inscribed from above. So on the one hand, that's true, but this, I think because of that, Spinoza thinks that in order for collective life to be possible, we have to have a common set of affects and desires. Um, and then last, the question about Fortis consumption and um, Marcuse. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, well, first thing I want to say about that, my little presentation of Lardone's idea there, because it's a point where I'm quite critical of, of Lardone. I think Lardone, Lardone is very quick and schematic about his history, right? For him, there was a point early on in capitalism, where the only thing that kept people working was their fear um, of being, you know, without food, without shelter. And this was fear is, is always a very imprecise, motivating, people are only going to want to do so much when they're motivated by fear. Um, and they're always going to be open to the possibility of revolting. And that uh, Fordist organization of desire shifts from a organization of work based on fear, an organization of work based on hope, and the hope is understood to be the hope to consume. And to some extent, the Fordist equation is based on the idea that you should forget about realizing any kind of desire in your labor, right? In the sense that you no longer get to be uh, a person who is a craftsman or whatever. Uh, you, you're a part in, a, in an overall laboring machine and to sort of channel all your desires into, um, into consumption. And then the third uh, sequence that Lordon identifies is the new desire of, the desire to, you know, realize yourself in your work. The desire is often espoused by sort of, you know, uh, Silicon Valley or various kind of, uh, you know, entrepreneurs or whatever, who like wouldn't stop working if you, you know, if you if, if would never want to stop working because their their work is their desire. I think the first point that I would say about that and is necessary point is that I think I find that history to be far too schematic and far too uh, uh, like rigid. I think that it's probably more accurate to say that there is always a little bit of all those compositions coexisting that sometimes sometimes you know fear still works as a motivating force people still work because they don't want to end up without a home and whatever fear desire of consumption and desire of the work all sort of combine together um but i think about the the point and i think that one of the things that that Ladon is quite good on is the sense that one of the things I think he finds quite interesting is that Spinoza makes desire, desire is man's very essence, integral to our existence, but desire is, as Verdon puts it, it is fundamentally intransitive. It does not have a, it is desi desire, it is undefined in terms of what it is a desire for. It is not a desire to just survive in a kind of Hobbesian way, nor is it a desire for the good in some sort of Aristotelian way. It is just desire. And it exists in the way in which it is shaped by our 
our encounters in our society. Um, and this is, I think, for, you know, for Lerdon, you know, in his earlier work, he really wanted to counter the notion that, that, uh, that there's some fundamental connection between ca capitalism and self-interest, because really, for Lerdon, all societies shape and determine the interest of the individuals living within them. And all those individuals, in some sense, um, I mean, we all, in that we live in a society, to some extent, we all learn what to desire. I mean, we learn poorly because we there is always a tension between the imposed uh, objects and meaning and our own idiosyncratic experiences, such that that none of us ever quite desire uh, the right way. But there is a sense in which all social structures are um, relations of desire. I mean, this goes to take another, and this is why in a similar way, Deleuze and Guattari say, there is only desire in the social and nothing else. Um, Thank you, Jason. We have Santiago and after Santiago, Liz, who was going to ask a question last time, left a question here, but uh, Previn will be before uh, we, we read aloud uh, Liz's thing. So go ahead, Santiago, and then you, Previn. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and thank you for your time and conversation, Jason. Um, I wonder if you could speak a bit more about uh, the, like some of your thoughts or, or potentially concise implications of the problem on, of trans individuality and collective life um especially the potential ramifications of confronting Spinoza and Marx vis-a-vis -vis, uh the ecology and the environment i know that there are spinozas uh, readings that are being published today that take into account different other more and sometimes less than human subjectivities and your work is very refreshing in terms of taking uh, Spinoza and, and, and putting it to work within this conversation. So I was wondering what's your take on this, um, in this area. I'm Kevin. I hope I say your name right. Oh, hi, Michael. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, and you did pronounce my name right, so thanks for that. Um, Jason, really enjoyed um, your, your presentation really uh, refreshing summary, um, very, very helpful, certainly for me, uh, working on the fringes. Um, <clears throat> but Jason, fundamentally, I have a real problem with any appeal in the left, which I've been aware of, um, to Spinoza. Um, Spinoza is used by, I was going to say us, um, to kind of give some kind of philosophical validation to the multitude, to the working classes, to the base, um, and, and try and inject some kind of hope that that is where history, potential future lies, and it is not um, defined by the tyrannical uh, king. However, Spinoza is a very subtle defense of the divine right of kings, isn't he? He's, he's not trying to get rid of authority. He's not trying to redistribute the authorization of the king and the state. Um, he's just kind of trying to point out a subtle relation which fundamentally reinforces hierarchical tyranny. And so I don't, I don't, re I, I wonder if it's a kind of seduction to use Spinoza uh, politically when actually his philosophical methodology does not give us a way to redistribute um, power and authority, decision-making, social organization. It's fundamentally um, quite medieval in that sense. Um, my other problem is a problem of philosophical method, and that is that Spinoza is fundamentally ontology, and that really, I don't know, I just find that so difficult because Marx is using dialectic, and dialectic is the hope. You know, you can work with contradiction. You've got something you, you can take forwards. Um, you can posit conflict as a very creative potential for future history, human history. And the dialectic sits to me very um, differently to Spinoza's ontology, which is ultimately, again, a tacit uh, acceptance of the way things are. And that's just how it's going to be. And I just don't get why 
uh, I say we, why the left, uh, turn to Spinoza. Um, certainly those are two objections I have. So with Liz's question and with Santiago and Preben, there's quite, you will have a good part of the next uh, Q&A section. Liz, as everyone can see, since she put this in chat to everyone, one is the distinction between affect and ideology, something you share. And the second part of that is you presented affect as prior to ideology, but I wonder why ideology isn't just understood as effective. Then number two, given your presentation, do you see any use and what use in Marx's distinction between materialism and idealism? And Jason, you have a lot on, uh, between the three, you have quite a bit to deal with right now. Okay, yeah, so, um... First, I, I starting with Santiago. Um, yeah, I mean the I don't. I mean, in some sense, I feel like the the uh, the question of trans individuality in the non in the non human. Um, I mean, I think it's easier for me to approach the the question of the non human or of the sort of especially as the non human is is tied up with as it seemed to be in your question with environmental questions through the question of finitude and the sense that, you know, part of Spinoza's understanding of finitude, which is a very different finitude than say a kind of Heideggerian death or whatever notion of finitude. It is a sense that, you know, we, we exist as relational beings. In other words, a part of what, I mean, we are individuated because we maintain the same sort of relations and then we, I mean, as the Bally Bar quote I, I put up said, you know, we cannot exist without constantly um, uh, taking in uh, uh, and new elements into our relations. And that you know, so the finitude is much, uh, much more about like not the, you know, one of the things I think is interesting about Spinoza in terms of thinking about finitude is that, you know, as he's quite famously said, you know, a free man thinks of nothing less than of death. Death is not the, the, the issue. The issue is the fact that we are finite in the sense that we are overpowered by the, the world and the universe and constantly dependent upon uh, the world around us. Um, uh, and to some extent, you know, there is both in Spinoza a profoundly, you know, this is where Spinoza has influenced sort of ecological thinkers in the sense that maybe the the relations ultimately determine us are the, you know, sort of like the earth and the, the idea that it has to be understood as the only true individual. It too is made up of multiple relations and so on. But there's also the Spinoza who says, you know, that we should feel totally comfortable in using animals and so on and so forth. Um, and I, I think that it is, um, and maybe I think you to take your suggestion, I think that maybe part of the usefulness of thinking trans individuality is it is that it if if my collectivity includes in it everything that shapes and determines my existence then there's no reason that 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 should end at all with the human and should also be understood to include the 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 natural world and um the animals that make up my my community as well. That's that's provocative, but I haven't really thought through what that what that what that would would mean. Um, uh, um, okay, as far as Previn goes, um, I mean, partly I just I don't I I don't see the same. I mean, Spinoza's politics is definitely very ambiguous. Um, I mean, his political treatise ends before he gets to democracy and his last word was not good ones, the exclusion of women and so forth. Um, but there is in Spinoza the sense that, I mean, I, and I take, I mean, I think Balibar was right about this, that, that democracy is as many people thinking as many things as possible, that there is um, that dimension in Spinoza. Although I, I do think that, um, that, uh, I mean, there are lots of questions. I mean, I'm I'm usually very comfortable being um, anachronistic because I think anachronism is an unavoidable effect of being shaped and determined by our existence. So the Spinoza, 
that I talked about and that I read would probably be unrecognizable to maybe Spinoza himself. Um, but I think that, you know, partly that is because, you know, the, the, to think, to recognize that one always thinks from determinate conditions and one is determinate historical situation um, means that uh, to me, there is no more kind of like flawed premise than the idea that I could ever really know what someone in a different historical period thought um, because I can't, I can't step outside my own historical moment. And uh, uh, so I, I'm sort of comfortable with that. The question of ontology versus dialectic. So that's a, that's definitely a question worth talking about. Um, uh, although as I, as I tried to say earlier, there is a sense in which, um, and I do think this is, this is a sort of tendency, a sense in which um, uh, on the one hand, uh, uh, as we we're saying about substance earlier, that you know maybe there's a tendency to try and read Spinoza's ontology as an ontology which is not one, um, and this is you know one of the things I think that is very interesting about Negri's reading of Spinoza, even though it's come under a lot of criticism recently, is that Negri takes very seriously the idea that in the middle of writing the Ethics, um, you know which was Spinoza's main work over the course of his life and was only published after his life, Spinoza stopped. And because of the political circumstances, he wrote the theological political treatise. And in part, you know, he tried to write the theological political treatise to make the argument as to why he should be able to publish the ethics, why freedom of thought should be around philosophical matters should be tolerated and encouraged. There's perhaps been no bigger failure in the history of philosophy between objective and outcome because uh, it did not open up the freedom of thought. It was immediately banned as a scandalous book and Spinoza's attempt to, to publish it anonymously sort of failed. Everyone kind of knew it was him. But uh, one of the things that, that Negri really draws on is that, and this is the part that, of Negri that uh, even Negri himself has distanced himself from, but the way in which parts one and two of the ethics seem to be very ontological in the sense of a theory of being and what the world is. And then you get into parts three and four of the ethics, and they seem to very much focus not on the world, but on things like desire, affects, the imagination, and their interrelations and how they shape and transform the world. And, and Negri's point is, as I, as, as I think an interesting one, is that Spinoza only got there um, by by his his political intervention, by recognizing that to some extent a philosophy cannot complete itself um, uh, as a kind of ontological speculation without engaging with ethical and political practice, and so I mean that and that to me is also one of the real draws between thinking. I mean to me, thinking about Spinoza and Marx is always thinking a moment of tension. I mean, there's a tension in terms of how they write, how they think. That to there. It is always about, I mean, and to me, it's one of the more fascinating relations in philosophy because philosophers tend to like thinking either in terms of the anxiety of influence, you know, how much did Hegel influence Marx, or thinking in terms of relations of opposition, how much is Marx a criticism of Hegel, right? And those questions are, you know, they have their, their place. But to me, it seems like the relationship between Spinoza and Marx, given that, uh, I mean, there's debates. I mean, some people say, Victoria Morfino, a good friend of mine, says, you know, that, that, that he says at one point that the, the Marx, Mar what Marx says about Spinoza is just a scholarly residue. It's not interesting. Uh, uh, that there is, in some sense, a non-relation between the two of them. And to, to some extent, the relation has to be invented. And I think part of the invention of that relation has to traverse the very different ways in which, um, you know, as I tried to say, like Spinoza and Marx both have a criticism of the isolated individual as a starting point. But in Spinoza, that criticism is thoroughly either, you can understand it is either ontological or anthropological. It's understood 
um, without history, whereas for Marx, it is understood, it is a, the, the isolated individual is a product of bourgeois society. It comes into existence through the interrelations of, so there's an interesting way in which even in their points of, of, of continuity, one has to think in terms of their uh, 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 differences. So lastly, I want to talk about Liz's question, which I think is, is an important one, about the relationship between affect and ideology as two different ways of uh, approaching Spinoza. I mean, one of the things is, um, I do think that part, partly I was saying that is I've, I've always been struck by the way in which Althusser, who is profoundly influenced by Spinoza, seems so uninterested in the discussion of affect in Spinoza. Um, I don't know. I have I have uh, 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 the new book uh, 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 Althusser e Spinoza di Torre Mituros, which just came out, uh, which includes some of Althusser's notebooks on Spinoza. I'm hoping to see if Spinoza says something. Althusser says something about this aspect. So I think that. Partly that was a reflection of the fact that I think that Althusser's reading of Spinoza focuses on the imagination independent of the affects. Now, the question about uh, the relationship between affect and ideology. Um, this is a question which I, I think I'm not going to be able to give. I, I give a much longer response to this. I have a book probably come, it'll come out next year uh, uh, from Verso called The Double Shift, Spinoza and Marx um, on the Politics of Work. And uh, I talk a lot about the relation between affect and ideology in that. Um, and, and there, I think it's very useful to think about um, there being sort of two different levels of ideology. Um, the sort of, and this is, goes back to what I was saying about Lord Don, I think one of the things about, is interesting about Lord Don is Lord Don gives an account of how we are effect, effectively shaped by capital independent of and prior to any ideological justification, right? That the compulsion to work and the compulsion to consume are affective reorientations that do not depend upon a ideological narrative or conceptualization in order to exist. So I think of that, I do think of that as kind of a layer. I think of it a layer in the same way that like some, Althusser will talk about the spontaneous ideology of the labor contract. One of the things Althusser talks about, which I think is very interesting, um, which kind of ties into that. I do think Spinoza is a theorist of the spontaneity of ideology. Uh, I think for Spinoza, the spontaneity of ideology is what he calls um, prejudice, and he then later goes on to talk about superstition and superstition is the way that, so what, what does the spontaneity of ideology mean in Spinoza? Well, it's just the tendency to see yourself as a kingdom within a kingdom, to see your desires as constitutive, not caused, and to think of yourself as like, like we don't look at ourselves and think, oh, I like this and like that because I've been shaped by my encounters and so on. We just think, hey, I decided to like this, like that. That's a spontaneous ideology in Spinoza. But I think Spinoza then goes on to show how what he calls superstition organizes that ideology, that spontaneity, into a coherent narrative and or tries to. And in a similar way, Althusser writes about you know the spontaneous ideology of the wage form, right? When you go to work and you sell your labor power, when you are paid, that paycheck treats your labor power as one, an individual attribute, not a collective process. And two is something that is paid in full, right? Not based on ex exploitation and so on. And the labor relation itself is a kind of spontaneous ideology. So, I, um, so anyways, what I'm trying to say is that I, I think that um, the reason why I think it's useful to think about the affect versus the more sort of intellectual dimension of ideology is it allows us to think about the multiple layers of ideology and their implication, that there is a kind of, like before anyone has to tell you about capitalism and its role in realizing desires, you've already been educated in the relationship between capitalism and desire the first time someone gave you some money and said, hey kid, knock yourself out in the candy store, get something you want. That came prior to any ideological justification and is in some sense there on a sort of base level um, and that we can't ignore the way in which 
I mean, this is another way of thinking about um, uh, overcoming the base superstructure model. One of the other limitations of it is it fails to recognize the way in which the base economic activity as a reorganization of desire has its own kind of ideological dimension. But I think it's useful to think about that level and then to think about the other, the other more uh, 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 consciously articulated and developed ideas that are usually identified by ideology. So to think the affective as uh, as necessarily a part of ideology, but also think of the affective along with the sort of mythic um, uh, uh, or, or, or conceptual dimensions of ideology. Um, I just want to go back to Liz just to make sure. Uh, the, the distinction in Marx uh, between materialism and idealism, you've kind of addressed, but did you want to say anything on her second part? Yeah, I mean, I could say a lot about it. I mean, I think this is, I mean, I think one of the, there's a, I don't know if she, is this what she meant by this, there is a big question um, about whether or not, you know, this goes back to, you know, like perhaps uh, ac anachronistic and twisted readings of Spinoza, uh, whether or not it really makes sense to call Spinoza a, uh, a materialist. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of these questions hinge upon the, the, how one interprets um, Spinoza's assertion in Proposition 2, I'm sorry, Proposition 7, a part two of the ethics, the order and connection of things is the same as the order and connection of ideas. Um, and, I mean, it's, a, and then from that, Spinoza goes on to say, that you know only an idea can determine another idea and only a body can determine another body so it's a strange uh, assertion because it combines both identification bodies and you know for, on the one hand for spinoza bodies and ideas are just two different ways of looking at the same thing right going back to what i was saying earlier about about desire appetite is when we, when we relate a a, a desire uh to our bodies, we call it appetite, and relate to our minds, we call it desire. So, um, uh, there is, I think, you know, that conjunction is, or that proposition, and the various ways in which it stems from it, the sense in which Spinoza try, is trying to think both identity and difference um, is, you know, I think it's fair to say that Spinoza, I don't think you can entirely equate Spinoza with I, materialism because, but I do think that to some extent what Spinoza offers us is a, a way of thinking, a kind of determinism to think both material determination and the determination of ideas. I mean, this is something that comes up in like the work of someone like Hassana Sharp, which I think is very interesting in her discussion of the force of ideas. That her point is that, you know, Spinoza's assertion that ideas have causality too, that ideas shape and affect different ideas, is a way to think about the fact that we are not just historically determined in terms of the way in which our bodies and desires are shaped in the world around us, but we are historically determined in the way in which the ideas that we come, that we associate with, that the ideas that, 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 that circulate and circulate through us to have their own causality and their own shaping. Right? This is why I think, you know, um, and I know a lot of criticism for this. I mean, I think that, that when Althusser talked about theoretical practice, his real sense was like, it is possible to, by creating and doing philosophical work, what you are ultimately doing is trying to act on and within the terrain of ideas. And ideas too have their own effects on each other that have to be understood as related to, but in some sense different from the way in which bodies shape and determine each other as well. 
but sometimes and, and here uh, 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 I think it's interesting to think about the way in which um, uh, Spinoza in the ethics um, when he's when he tries to talk about some of the most like like when, he, when, he, when Spinoza talks about say for example jealousy as an affect uh, and jealousy is the combination of you know my love for for someone combined with the thought that they might love someone else and so on what the interesting thing about spinoza is that there in trying to make sense of an affect something something intimately felt he says the best way to understand an affect is by thinking about the relations of ideas i mean this is what uh, chantal jacquet calls um in her reading of spinoza the logic of alternation her reading is that sometimes sometimes it makes sense to understand affects by looking at the ideas that shape them and sometimes it makes sense to look at ideas by looking at the affects that shape them that sometimes we have to understand that this this order and connection means that we have to recognize that there are these two different layers layers of ideas and layer of bodies and that we are we're situated in terms of both of them but sometimes the causal determination of one is more important than the causal determination of another and I think that also means that sometimes, you know, when it comes to politics, sometimes, sometimes the ideological determinations are what are important, and sometimes um, the the relations of bodies are more important. Um, yeah. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Alia has another question, and after her, Katrinelle is asking, um, could you please offer an effective reading of alienation? But Alia, go ahead. That's really funny because I was going to ask whether, Jason, uh, how we should put Mark and Spinoza on conversation on the matter of commodity fetishism, uh, which also is not unrelated to the, to the question about alienation and not unrelated to the, what we've just discussing so far about ideology. Um, I would also love to know what uh, essay of Vittorio, as you were mentioning, um, Vittorio Morfino, uh, about the, the substantialization. Are we overly substantializing um, uh, Spinoza? Yeah, um, the 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 Morfino essay is is called uh, I think it's called Spinoza and Ontology of Relation, and it was published by the Graduate Faculty Journal. That's what comes out of the New School. Um, uh, I don't know if they've put all their stuff up online in PDF form or whatever. If you email me Jason Reed at main.edu, I will send you a copy though. Um, uh, so yeah, com so first I'll, I'll then I'll, I'll find the stack. I'll do commodity. I'll talk about commodity fetishism. And talk about alienation. Um, now, I mean, I think commodity fetishism. Well, one of the things, and I've I've, I've written a, a piece about this. Um, one of the things that interests me about Spinoza, thinking about Spinoza and commodity fetishism, is the strange um, structural similarity between the famous chapter on commodity fetishism and uh, uh, in Marx and Spinoza's appendix um, to part one of the ethics from which out to gets to ideology. They both are, they're, I mean, they both are, you know, incredibly influential texts, but they also are texts that are strangely uh, uh, preemptive in the sense that, you know, in the commodity fetish section, Marx kind of gets into talking about like how a mode of production shapes its culture, its religion, our way of making sense of the world. And he does that, you know, like it's preemptive in the sense that Marx has really only talked about labor and value so far. He hasn't really developed his theory of social relations. And some would argue that he never quite fully fleshes out, you know, his theory of social relations in Capital One. And we're constantly sort of trying to fill that gap. Um, so there, and, and in a similar way, Spinoza's uh, appendix is very preemptive in the sense that he hasn't talked about human intellect, human desires, etc. But he needs to, and I think both Spinoza and Marx are preemptive for the same reason. They both recognize that, like, their readers. And this is, I think, this is what makes them both very materialist as practitioners of philosophy, if not in theorists of philosophy. They both realize, oh my God, no one's going to believe what I'm saying. 
right? Marx is like, everyone just thinks values, commodities just possess value. And Marx thinks, I mean, sorry, Spinoza thinks everyone just thinks they're free individuals and God is this big free individual up in the sky. I'm going to have to address that before I can get any further. I'm going to have to address this very hard, entrenched illusion that's not a philosophical position because it exceeds philosophy. It's part of the world we live in. I'm going to have to address that before I can even move on. So that's one point of commonality. The second is, uh, I mean, Spin thinking, uh, to me, a Spinoza's theory of, of commodity fetishism um, is, is interesting because, you know, what does Spinoza say in, in, in a, a false idea is? It's an inadequate idea. It's an idea that does not express its cause, right? And to some extent, that's what a commodity is, right? Um, Deleuze and Guattari like, love this line from Marx. It's very strange they love this one because it's an odd line when they, where Marx says, the taste of the porridge tells us nothing about the conditions under which the wheat was grown. Um, and, but I think there's a certain sense in which that's what a commodity is. A commodity is cut off from the actual, like when we see it at the store, it is cut off from the actual causal conditions that it produced it. And, and this is something I think Deleuze and Guattari will insist on, is that the more it is disconnected from its actual causal conditions, the more we can connect it to other imaginary causal conditions, right? But the more we can connect it to other things disconnected. So, um, so I think in a certain reading, a, a commodity fetish is the, um, is an idea caught, caught off from its, uh, 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 conditions. And uh, uh, Cesare Casarino has a really good essay on this point where he talks about, he points out the fact that both Marx and Spinoza use this term, they use uh, the, uh, the nexus, the connection of all things. Um, and Spinoza says at one point in the, in the appendix, people have not thought about the connection of all things. And Marx says this in the commodity fetish. People have not thought about the connection of all things. So there's a certain sense in which I think both um, uh, Spinoza, yes, that essay, uh, Spinoza and Marx uh, uh, articulate the idea that adequate understanding of a thing is to understand all the causal connections of it. So now I want to shift to, to uh, Catronel's point about, about alienation, which I think is an interesting one. Because um, there is, I think, and I don't, I, I, I'm conscious of time here. There is a, there's an ongoing debate in, in I think, Spinoza's Marxism, um, uh, whether or not it makes sense to talk about a theory of alienation in Spinoza. Um, and part of the, part of the debate comes from, and, and, and I think one of the big, uh, because, uh, uh, Earlier, I didn't talk about Francois Mat uh, Alexander Maturon. Sorry, Fran De Francois is a different person. I didn't talk about him either. Alexander Maturon, you know, talks about there is a sense in which um, he, the Argus Spinoza does have a theory of alienation. The alienation is this, um, the individual that sees themselves as a kingdom within a kingdom is alienated from their, their world. And, and uh, Frank Fischbach has a book which I've been translating um, uh, 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 on Spinoza and Marx, where he uh, argues that Spinoza's theory of alienation is a very different one than the classical one that we associate with Marx, because it's not alienation as a sort of loss of the subject in an object, the way we get when you read the estranged labor sense in which the object becomes richer, the subject becomes poor, but um, it has to be understood as subjectivity, a subject without objectivity, a subject who's a pure subject, a pure labor power, disconnected from a place in the world with only their labor power to sell, that's alienation. So not alienation as opposed to subjectivity, but subjectivity as alienation. And he argues that this is, this is, goes against a certain reading of alienation in, in, in a certain way Marx has been read, but he argues it's not an, on Marx's notion. In fact, it might be in Fishbach's terms, it might be the the alienation that that is in the lat the later Marx, in which to be a subject stripped of your to be pure labor power, Vogelfrei, you know, 
compelled to sell your labor is to be alienated. Now, the argument against um, alienation in Marx comes from Pascal Savarac, who argues that, uh, sorry, alienation in Spinoza, who argues that, that for Spinoza, we have to understand that um, there is no potentiality that is not actual. So the alienation seems to presuppose there's a sense, there's you know, my species being, there's my potential as a human being, and that's being kind of frittered away and having to work. Um, and, and that um, uh, that is something that Severac argues is absolutely incompatible with Spinoza's theory. That for Spinoza, everything is always already actual and that there can be no potential that is not actual. But uh, Severac argues, and this is something that Laudan picks up on in his re reading of, of Spinoza, there is a, you know, because Spinoza will talk a lot about, especially in the latter chapters of the ethics, about the necessity of having like a variety of different experiences, of seeing multiple different things. And to some extent, um, uh, uh, Lordon following Severac argues that we have to understand that alienation in for Spinoza is fixation. It is um, the, the limitation of one's powers and potentials to a given thing. Now I realize, that, and I've been talking about this for a while, I haven't really said anything about affect and alienation. And I think this is, I think this is to me, this is one of the real problems with the notion of, um, I think that, because, I mean, alienation would have to be understood, obviously, as sad affects, as Spinoza would say, right? That when you're alienated at your work, um, you are, um, you know, unhappy, sad, hate it, hate your boss, etc. cetera. Um, but I think that one of the things that, that, especially Lord Don on this point is interesting is that Lord Don wants to say, look, look, the problem is that, is that we, I want a theory that also explains why the person who claims that they love their job and that they would work all the time if they could, why that person is alienated to, I want to understand joyful alienation and what joyful alienation is. And I think, Consumer society offers a good example of joy, joyful alienation in which one that there's there are joys in consumer society. But the problem is because Spinoza makes a distinction between passive and active joys, right? Passive joys are the joys that I am not a cause of. They kind of befall me, fall upon my lap. They increase my power and capacity to act, but I'm still in some sense subordinated to them. I and Consumer society, to me, is the ultimate producer of passive joys. It offers you pleasures, but you do not control the conditions of those pleasures. In fact, you don't control them to your own detriment because consumer society functions by constantly snatching away the very pleasure that it offers you. Hey, you bought this thing. Isn't that cool? But there's another thing that's even cooler, right? If, if, if consumer society ever satisfied us the way it promises to satisfy us, the whole economy would come to a crashing halt because that cool thing that we bought would be that cool thing that we bought and it would be so cool that we would never want to buy something else. It has to necessarily subvert the very joys that it pretends to offer. And that is because in the Spinoza's reading, it is passive joys. It is joys that we do not produce. So to be stuck with, so there is both, I think on this reading, there is, obviously there is, sad alienation. There's the alienation of feeling the sense of work being a, a hindrance to your possibilities and your action. But there's also joyful alienation. There is the alienation of being sort of led from joy to joy, from moment to moment, without controlling and determining the conditions of the production of one's own joy and that to some extent i think uh Lordon would say especially for us you know for people living in places like france and the u.s and so on 
uh, and the people who, uh, you know, that is to some extent the more pernicious alienation because the it doesn't seem to have the same uh, built-in critical perspective towards it. Jason, we are coming to the end, but I want to ask a very silly question and also a very serious one. You've already mentioned that you have a book coming out with Verso next year, and we would love to have you back to uh, share that book with uh, an audience like you had today. And there, were pe there are people still here from various places in the world. But also in your slideshow, you had that sign. And I'm so tired of the other signs. What was, did you get any, any interesting conversations at your front yard over that sign? I mean, I'm asking a question that takes up the last minute at most. Yes. Uh, I actually, because, because I live in Maine and because the ground just thawed, <laughs> I just put that sign out this, this, this weekend. Um, and I already have had two positive comments, although there's been some debate within, uh, within my house with my partner and I as to whether or not people are actually going to read it. And we're not people to see the different colors and they'll just think it's the other sign that you see everywhere. Um, and I think that's probably, probably true, but, but at least my, my next door neighbor and one of his, his friends visiting. So, so far I've had, I've had two, two comments about it. And as for your first question, I would, I would, this has been great. Um, and I would love Eric. to, to come back. Um, uh, when, when the book comes out that, that I, I, yeah. Definitely. So when I know more about when that's happening, I will, I will be in touch and we can talk, we can talk about that. And more importantly, thank you so much, Jason, the, the work you put in and your presentation and how thoroughly you took on every question. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and you. Ozzie. Thank you to everyone who came. It was great to have all of you. And I'm glad you came to hear what Jason had to say. So Thanks so much. Uh, all right, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your weekends. Take care. Thank you.